rolling. So, good afternoon. Good uh, my afternoon. name is Ming. Uh, you're Dr. Alondra Nelson, as we are all familiar with now. Um, so, I am interviewing you on behalf of the Boston Global Forum and our partners at in Japan, the Shinzo Abe Initiative. Um, but so let's just get started. Um, so, what are your some takeaways or reflections from your overall experience uh, leading the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, now that it's over? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the big reflection is that science and technology policy affects everything. So I think there was a time when people working in government thought you know, it was sort of arcane and obscure and there were just a few policy issues that mattered for it. But I think every major domestic and international policy issue has something to do with science and technology policy. So it means it's a really important time for science policy and for people to be engaged and involved in science policy. So I think that's my, my big headline. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so what were some of the challenges uh, during your ten tenure during the administration and how do you navigate them? Sure. Well, the big challenge was that we started the administration at the high water mark of the pandemic. So we did a transition between two presidential administrations um, uh, at first just on Skype and with conference calls and then on Zoom. So, you know, people were slowly transitioning to coming to Washington and many people didn't come for many months. And so um, you were building a team often of people who didn't know each other. Um, particularly in the science and technology policy space, you're building a team of people with different kinds of subject matter expertise, and so, um, and people who have been, you know, in the military sometimes, who've been in the academy. So there's lots of different social networks, professional networks converging, and and people don't know each other, and you have to make those networks into a mission-oriented organization, um, and you had to do that on Zoom. Oh. So so that was a challenge, but I think that we I think that we succeeded in the end. I'd say so. You yeah yeah. Yeah. Um, and were there any conflicts with like the, the the administration or the White House when you were developing these policies or working? No, right I now? mean you know the thing. I think the thing we forget about. Um, government is that at its best, it is like a mission driven organization and everyone should be aligned with the mission. So, you know, you come into office, I was a political appointee um, and there had been work in the transition and the administration said, these are our priorities. We want more scientific integrity. We want um, science and technology policy that expands opportunities for more people um, in addition to like doing extraordinary discovery and driving innovation. Um, and so you're very clear what your marching orders are. Um, and you know the the sort of challenge is sort of how everybody sort of plugs in um, yes. to that to that mission. Right. And did you accomplish all or like most of what you set out to uh, do when you started uh, your role? Well, you know, I had never worked in government before, and so I didn't even I think know to have aspirations or to have <laughs> goals. You know, I, my goals were the goals of uh, of President Biden and Vice President Harris. Um, and you know, we didn't. I think so. I think the big goal is like you don't want to let down um, the president and vice president of the United States. Um, but we were also able to do some some good policy, um, including things like the the AI Bill of Rights um, and uh, a, a ten year plan on fusion energy. Um, we also stood up the cancer cabinet and the sort of reignited the President Biden's cancer moonshot. So we got a lot of good work done, and of course the Chips and Science Act, which is really important for. Um, transforming the kind of semiconductor supply chain. Definitely. Yeah. And I guess um, related to that, so what, if there weren't, like, was there anything that you think you, you could have done or, like, that you, you would have included if you had the time or bandwidth to do so? like outside of what you, you did? Sure. I mean, I left over about a year ago. I left the administration, and I think um, a lot of what I wanted, wanted to carry forward is being carried forward. So the president um, signed an executive order on artificial intelligence last fall, um, and that's just, I think, yesterday or the day before um, uh, hit its six-month uh, six mark. So there's a lot of um, tasks that were in that executive order to all sorts of agencies, the Department of Energy, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, that they had to hit, the, hit these benchmarks. Um, and um, folks are hitting the benchmarks. And so I think a lot of the implementation of the po policy ideas that we developed in my time in government are now coming to fruition or beginning to be implemented. And it's great to see. Yes. And for you personally, uh, what uh, what did it mean for you to uh, become the deputy like uh, director of the uh, office? Um, you know, it was a big deal. I mean, I was announced, I was the first deputy that was announced. There were several deputies in the office, um, and I was announced uh, on a stage uh, with uh, the, the um, director of the office 
um, with then President-elect Biden um, and Vice President-elect uh, Harris in Wilmington, Delaware. You know, it was a national um, sort of press conference. It was extraordinary. My parents were very proud and excited, and I was glad to have the opportunity to publicly thank them for everything that they've done for me. So that was amazing. Um, and then I would go on to be acting director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, and, you know, be the first, second, only, I think only the second woman and the first woman of color um, to lead U.S. science and technology policy, and, and um, I'm tremendously proud of that. That's awesome. Um, and how different is the working, I guess, like environment and, uh, yeah, working environment uh, between government and academia where you came from? Oh, okay. Well, you know, <laughs> the pace is like extraordinarily different. I mean, yeah. you know, academia, it's like if you have two meetings and, you know, write a couple paragraphs on your book, you're like exhausted and feel like you've like accomplished a great day. And you are doing a lot of kind of cognitive labor, so it is exhausting. Um, I think working in Washington and working in policy is the hardest work I've ever done. I mean, you work 18, 20 hour days kind of fairly consistently. Um, you asked earlier about, you know, what were some of the goals you had and did you accomplish them? You know, that the saying about, there's an American saying about, you know, kind of be, be, mind, be careful of your best laid plans because they're never gonna, you know, something always comes up. And I think working in policy and working in Washington, D.C., you think you have a plan for what you're going to be doing and how you're going to proceed, but something happens in geopolitics. You know, Russia invades Ukraine, um, or, you know, there's, uh, you know, inflation is, is, is rising, and, you know, are there science and technology sort of policy implications or mitigations to do around that? So there are all of these externalities, and at the same time, you've got these, um, these goals that you've been given from the president and the vice president to achieve um, in this sort of uh, um, sort of complicated terrain, and so it's um, it's a faster pace. It's also um, long-term strategy, short-term strategy. There's a lot of just different timelines, and then there's also um, work in which you're just waiting. So you sometimes will finish policy documents or policy analyses and. You sort of think to yourself, okay, well, we did that, and nobody's asking for it. But the whole point of the office, in part, is um, that when the West Wing calls and says, "What do we know about fusion energy, or what are we going to do about X or Y?" You got to be ready. Right. So the document's sitting there, and you're kind of like, "Oh, we finished that. Now what's going to happen?" Um, uh, but in many instances, you're going to get that call, and you got to jump up and get ready and get ready to brief. Um, you know, someone on the president's senior team uh, about what's happening. So there's all sorts of timelines and temporalities, I think, that are, um, I think, hard to get used to, but make the work, um, uh, you know, quite uh, exhilarating sometimes. Yeah, and you can feel like the impact uh, of sorts, you know, like yeah. in, on the real world instead of where, you know, academia is more theoretical. Like yes, this. yes. Yeah. Um, so kind of like tangentially, you mentioned the issues of geopolitics. Um, earlier, and a big thing that um, the BGF focus on is the current global uh, security issues mm -hmm. and peacemaking. So, what do you think um, will be needed to realize these um, uh, recommendations and uh, policy direction on on AI, but also like science and technology that the administration and uh, you have laid out? Uh, especially considering there's a lot of like you know, alternative visions that may not be as good for the role. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, I um, have new perspective on that, man, because oh. I, um, uh, in October, the Biden administration nominated me to serve as the U.S. representative to this United Nations high-level advisory board on AI. And so uh, it's about nearly 40 people from every kind of area covered by the UN. Um, and we're trying to think about a global governance for AI. Um, and this includes colleagues from Russia, it includes colleagues from, uh, from China, um, as well as you know, lots of other parts of the world. And it is the sort of slow but critical work um, at a time when a technology is moving very fast of trying to um, figure out what it is we agree on. Yes. Um, and so I still think that you know, diplomacy is really important and I think it's incredibly important to get people in a room together um, to talk through issues and, you know, and I think um, fundamentally across different kinds of uh, economic systems, political systems, political ideologies, when you're thinking about uh, AI and emerging technologies, you know, I think what people agree on, um, and certainly in the U.S. in a bipartisan way, is they want the benefits of these technologies and they want to mitigate the harms. Yes. And so, you know, obviously there's a lot of, um, granularity to how people want to do that, but I think 
thinking, you know, beginning, being able to start with those broad themes and aspirations for kind of global humanity um, is, uh, is a good place to start. It is definitely important uh, yeah. to keep in mind as the world continues to uh, create more flashpoint yeah. Uh, yeah. around, you know, different parts. Um, so, I, this is, uh, so as part of like the Shindo Abe initiative, we are, which is more focused on the Asia Pacific region, but mm -hmm. we also, you know, as you said before, uh, discuss um, <clears throat> um, the collaboration, potential collaborations between um, the U.S., Europe, India, and Japan as a big liberal mm -hmm. democracies um, around the world. So do you think there's room for um, collaboration on AI governance um, in those specific areas? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in part, as you said, you know, these are some of the world's big and important democracies, and yeah. so there's already collaboration on lots of other sectors of society. Um, and so it makes perfect sense that AI would be one of these. We know that um, next month, actually, um, uh, that Korea is going to host the next uh, AI safety summit. Um, um, so that will be important. Um, and I will also should also say, um, because you're asking about the, the your Abe initiative, um, before I worked in Washington, I was president of a research nonprofit called the Social Science Research Council. And um, we have, for many years, that organization uh, has hosted an Abe fellowship. Oh, um, wow. And the fellowship is intended to um, foster collaboration between journalists in the U.S. and in Japan, and there's sort of cross-cultural exchanges. Um, so it's been work that I've been committed to a long, for a very long time, and I'm, I'm delighted to have, uh, you know, the Abe initiative come, you know, the Abe uh, tradition come back into my life. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and also related to that, um, so uh, how do you think um, AI and AI governance and the science community broadly um, can help um, mitigate or influence impact these uh, current global geopolitical issues? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the thing that I think we're all realizing if we didn't already is that science and technology policy is also national security policy yes. and is also geopolitical uh, policy. Um, and so these things are, you know, I think, you know, when we're in school, like if you're taking a political science class or something, I think that we talk about them in these in different lanes and in fact, Science and technology policy is probably not in your average political science class at all, um, but it's increasingly clear that um, all of these things are are very uh, intertwined um, and interdependent, and so we've got to think about them all together. And so that means that you need more scientists and technologists and engineers working in policy more general, working in you know domestic policy and international policy more general, um, uh, and you need more scientists, engineers, technologists, et cetera, uh, working in government as well. Um, and now that you've returned to academia mostly um, with your new work at the UN, but um, uh, how are you, are you still helping drive these AI policies that you help started out uh, forward uh, yeah. in that space? So the Biden administration has very um, strict kind of, uh, um, kind of revolving door kind of ethics policies. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm not doing any work anymore with the White House yes. and I'm not able to for ethics reasons for a couple of years. Um, but I have been uh, advising um, uh, U.S. Uh, members of Congress and their staffs on, on thinking about AI policy. Been working with legislators in California and Connecticut and other places um, as well. Um, and also just, uh, you know, I've um, created a, a working group uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study where I'm on the faculty and we spend, um, we write white papers and are, you know, um, uh, and sort of issue, I think, you know, expert comment um, yes. on, on different kinds of policy issues related to AI. So. Um, you know the policy brain. My policy brain is still um, is still still still, still, active. still active. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely um, tech and science policy literacy is definitely needed among so uh, not just politicians in the U.S. but around the world. So, yeah. 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 It's definitely good that you're keeping it active. Yeah. And also, I think um, because, as I said at the you know at the beginning of our conversation, because so much important international domestic policy wind in some way through science and technology. Um, you know, it's it's really important to sort of, I think, keep what have been important, um, I think, principles of the Biden administration in the conversation, um, and that's that if we do science and technology policy right, we can expand opportunity for people, um, we can, you know, drive the economy, um, we can create a more equitable society. Um, and so while you're doing so, you know, it sounds like science and technology policy, but it opens a world to all of these other um, 
potential goods for right. society that are really important. Yeah. From technology and science policy comes progress. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, hopefully. Most times. Sometimes. That's where we try to get. Yeah. Too. That's yep. where we try to go. With, and that's what policy does, right? Yes. Exactly. It stewards this direction rather than that direction. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so taking a longer longer term view, so what do you think or what do you hope would be like the outcomes of the uh, policies and uh, recommendations that you and the administration had uh, laid out? Um, I think I'll just talk, I can talk about uh, AI in yeah. particular, those policies. I mean, I, I hope that, you know, we've got a lot of aspirations, you know, I mean, we talk about AI and sort of sweeping language about the ability to cure cancer and have tremendous health breakthroughs. Um, uh, the, you know, to help mitigate climate change, um, and you know, but all of that's going to have to, all of that takes policy, right? It's not an inherent characteristic of the technology. It's all going to take policy to get us there. Um, and so I hope that we will, um, that some of the outcomes will be reaching some of those benefits that we hope for, um, and and not having um, exacerbated the harms that people are already experiencing um, through the uses of AI and the concerns and um, worries that they have about you know, job displacement and you know um, disempowering workers, um, uh, issues around facial recognition technology and issues of bias and discrimination. So um, we've got our work cut out yes. for us. Yeah, you do for the not not just the next uh, decade, but fifty years, sixty years. Sure, indeed. Um, and I think that was time. So oh, thank you for. Uh, uh, sitting down with me today and talking about uh, your work and uh, AI policy in general. Great, so, to, right. great to speak with you, man. Right, thank you. Thank All you. Right. All right, that's good. Chop. Chop. Cut. Cut. <laughs>